Hey, I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, January 13th, 2019, day 23 of Donald Trump's shutdown. Government shutdown is getting worse by the day. He's getting dumber by the day. He continues to lie as more information and more facts come out to prove that he is lying and prove that Donald Trump is the first Russian president of the United States, as I told you, in 2017 and 2018. Well, look, we have a fantastic show tonight. We're going to be joined in a few minutes by Dr. Claude Anderson. Dr. Claude Anderson is the author of Black Label, White Wealth, and he's the author of Powernomics. He's also the author of Dirty Little Secrets about Black History, Volume 1 and 2, and his latest book, A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. We're going to talk about a, a few very important uh, topics, the uniqueness and the sex, exceptionality of black people, the uniqueness and exceptionality of black people will also talk about a new initiative that he's launching called the us Too movement, the us Too movement. Now we've heard about the me too movement dealing with holding men accountable for sexual assaults and things like this, right? Like Bill Cosby and Harvey Weinstein and R Kelly, Robert Sylvester Kelly. We're going to talk about R Kelly uh, in the second hour. You don't want to miss that. Okay. But also Dr. Claude Anderson is launching a us Too movement, hashtag us Too movement, which deals with putting issues uh, pertaining to African-Americans first. Okay, so we'll talk to him about that as well. And then also he's going to talk about his Pan-African agenda for African-Americans when it comes to uh, also doing business with our brothers and sisters on the continent of Africa as well. Then in the second hour, we're going to be joined by Dr. Paul Finkelman. Now, you've heard me mention Dr. Paul Finkelman here on the show before. Dr. Paul Finkelman is a scholar uh, himself. He is the author of Slavery and the Founders, Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. Slavery and the Founders, Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. And he's also uh, the writer of the New York Times article that you've heard me reference before, The Monster of Monticello, The Monster of Monticello, that deals with some of the treachery of Thomas Jefferson. Now, even though Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner, a brutal slave owner, right? But he also is important to study in history because Thomas Jefferson wrote the majority of the U.S. Constitution, which is the supreme law of the land. He also uh, was part of that five-man committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence as well. Okay, so we're going to be joined by Dr. Paul Finkelman, and we're going to talk about uh, his appearance at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. It's coming up uh, this Tuesday, January 15th. And he's going to be speaking on Thomas Jefferson and slavery. Thomas Jefferson and slavery. He's a brilliant scholar, brilliant historian. Uh, I've read some of his articles. I talked to him uh, a couple of days ago and talked to him uh, today as well. So we'll speak with uh, Dr. Paul Finkelman in the second hour. All right. And you don't want to miss that. All right. And then uh, we'll also uh, talk about some of the things that have been going on uh, this past week as well. So we know that um, we're in day 23 of uh, Donald Trump's shutdown, okay, this ridiculous shutdown, uh, because Donald Trump is one of the worst negotiators I've ever seen also. He claims to be the writer of the art of the deal. He did not write the art of the deal. His ghostwriter was Tony Schwartz. Tony Schwartz actually wrote the art of the deal. And day after day, Donald Trump makes less and less sense, okay? And he proves he has no clue what he's doing. All right, so we saw that um, on Tuesday, Donald Trump at 9 p.m. gave a uh, presidential address, okay, from the White House. And he tried to make a case once again for this fake wall that he said Mexico was going to pay for. Now he's holding 800,000 uh, government workers uh, hostage, okay, to force uh, to force Congress to fund a wall that he lied and said Mexico was going to pay for. All right. So uh, we're going to talk some about one of the claims that he made in his address. He said African Americans and Hispanics are hardest hit by illegal immigration uh, when it comes to lower wages and jobs. Well, on News One Now with Roland Martin um, earlier this week, they did a fact check dealing with these claims from Donald Trump and Roland Martin uh, spoke with Dr. William Briggs, who is Dr. William Spriggs, who is an economist from uh, Howard University. 
okay? And you don't want to miss that. We'll have that in the second hour. And then also, Fallout continues from Surviving R. Kelly, Surviving R. Kelly. All right, did you survive Surviving R. Kelly? That's the question that everybody's asking. Now, uh, there have been new reports that came out this week about investigations launched in Georgia and a possible investigation in Chicago into these allegations from numerous women. As well, we know there were over a dozen women who claimed to be survivors of uh, relationships with R. Kelly as well, alleging everything from sexual abuse to domestic violence, uh, manipulation, all different types of things like this, right? Okay, so surviving R. Kelly um, sheds light on a bigger issue of black women being raped at higher rates and reported less. Now, that is something that's not talked about, okay? That's something that's not talked about. And uh, I have a segment, WXYZ picked up a segment from their Cleveland uh, affiliate dealing with how African-American women suffer uh, sexual abuse at a higher rate than any other uh, group of women in this country, and they report it at a lesser rate. And oftentimes when they do come forward, they are chastised and berated by people who look like them, which is one of the reasons why you have a lower rate of African-American women coming forward. So we'll talk about that. That's extremely important because if we're not willing to protect our women, our girls, our daughters, our nieces, then what are we doing? And then uh, also R. Kelly is under criminal investigation as well. As I said, we'll talk some about that. And he's also suffering, reports are, from uh, a number of panic attacks, a number of panic attacks. So January 8th was his birthday. And that was the, his that was his 52nd birthday. And that was also the day that uh, information came out about criminal investigations as well. So we'll deal with all of that uh, on tonight's episode of the African History Network show. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right knowledge corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you haven't taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. Okay? So when you control the radius of a man's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the show. We deal with current events in history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and sign up for the uh, email newsletter there as well. Uh, Before we bring Dr. Anderson on, I want to let you know that uh, I will be speaking at, uh, coming up on the 21st, uh, once again for Dr. King Day, I will be speaking at Second Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church in Detroit. Yes, I do speak at churches. Uh, 441 Monroe Street in Detroit in Greek Town. They are doing a uh, MLK Day uh, celebration. I'm the keynote speaker uh, to mark the 33rd observance of the Dr. King uh, birthday, 2019. The historic Second Baptist Church, which was part of the Underground Railroad. That was the last stop of the Underground Railroad before they go over to Canada, Okay. Um, Second Baptist Church of Detroit will host an interfaith program and breakout discussion coming together in divided times, coming together in divided times. And I'm going to do with the revolutionary Dr. King, the one they don't talk about every Dr. King day. OK, the Dr. King that focused on economic empowerment, the Dr. King that supported the black power movement. I'm going to deal with the Dr. King. They don't want you to know about. All right. Um, so this is taking place uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Monday, January 21st, 2019. We'll give you some more information uh, about that as well, and that's free and open to the public and bring the family also, okay? All right, so on the line, uh, we're joined by one of my teachers and uh, one of our great scholars, uh, Dr. Claude Anderson, who has a lot of powerful information uh, for us tonight. All right, so how you doing tonight, Doc? Oh, I'm sad to Midland for a poor man, just going tired of older and poor and blacker. <laughs> All right, Doc, that's a dangerous combination, man. Tighter, <laughs> older, poor, and blacker. That, that's a dangerous combination. Isn't that a bad combination for a man? Absolutely. <laughs> but, yeah, but, I, but that's, I've been like that most of my life, so I'm not going to change in my old age now. 
Right, I understand that. Well, look, you called me on Monday. You called me this past Monday, and there were some spe- specific things that you wanted to uh, talk about. Now, uh, all right, we'll get Dr. Anderson straight here in just a minute. Um, we'll get him here uh, straight in just a minute. Now, be sure to visit his website, powernomics.com. Powernomics.com. He has a special promotion right now, okay? You can get all five of his books and a DVD presentation for $99. Once again, his latest book is A Black History Reader, uh, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. Okay, that's his latest book. And what we're going to talk about tonight, we'll deal with the uh, we'll deal with the Us Too movement, okay? And also, uh, he wants to talk about the exceptionality and uniqueness of black people, our contributions to this country, and how we want it to be, and how we want to be treated, recognized, and compensated for our contributions to this country. Okay, so you don't want to miss that conversation. And then also, we'll talk about his Pan African agenda uh, for Black people. And then I saw uh, Dr. Anderson, uh, Dr. Mumbi, the sister name, Dr. Mumbi, who is um, from Africa. Uh, she has a YouTube show, and I saw an interview that uh, Dr. Mumbi did with Dr. Claude Anderson. She visited the U.S. She's from Kenya, actually. And um, she visited the U.S., and it was a fantastic interview where Dr. Anderson was talking about how uh, black Americans, uh, black people in America, can unite with continental Africans to do business, okay? But it's not one person going over or two or three people going over to set up a business in Africa. No, he's talking about something very, very important. Do we have him back? Okay. All right. So let's bring Dr. Claude Anderson back on. Okay, Doc, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And okay. uh, just talk as loud as you can, but I'm here. Okay. That sounds much better. I can hear you. All right. All right. Well, look, you called me Monday and uh, you said uh, that you wanted to come on to talk about some very uh, specific things, some things that are very, very important uh, to black Americans in uh, 2019. And you wanted to deal with the uh, uniqueness and exceptionality of black people. You wanted to talk about your new initiative, the Us Too movement, and then also uh, a Pan-African agenda for black people. So um, go ahead, brother. What is, uh, what, what, what's, what's so exceptional and unique about uh, black people in America? <laughs> Boy, now, now that is a good question. And, right. that, and, and that is the key, oh, Michael, to black folk being able to survive in this country in progress. It, and without that understanding, we're going to be in deep, deep trouble. Right. And, and uh, but the uniqueness of black folk is that they, they, throughout history, every time black folk got a chance to come out of the woodwork, and to come out of the mud and muck to be something, there was all they, there were always an effort by the and pushback by the majority of society, and particularly its basic institutions, including the United States Supreme Court, to neutralize, to corrupt, to misdirect anything that could have possibly change the social construct. That the, that the United States Constitution locked black folk into in, in 1789. Mm-hmm. They've been locked and kept there. And, uh, and, and this is the first time with this new movement going on across this country, the Me Too movement, for black folks to pick up and understand that we are not progressing in America. And so consequently, I'm saying rather than allowing themselves to be displaced conscientiously, as they've always been done, by by either by class issues, euphemisms like poor people, minorities, people of color, diversity, multicultural, poor people, and on so on and so on. This is time steps. No, we're tired of that. No more me too. Right but now, it's going to be an us too movement. Uh, us too movement. Us, mm-hmm. Yeah, us too movement based on our exceptionality, and that's what I cannot see why some people don't understand it. Okay, a lot now, of people keep. Okay, now hold it, hold it right there. Now we 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 we're up against a break. We're gonna bring you back in two minutes, and we'll continue with why people can't see the the uh, us two movement. Okay, so stand by, Doc. Uh-huh. All right, you listen to the African History Network show nine ten a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio on Michael M Hotel with Dr. Claude Anderson. We'll be back in two minutes. Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on nine ten a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, brother Michael M Hotel. It is Sunday, January thirteenth. 2019, and we are live. We're speaking with one of my teachers, uh, one of our great scholars, Dr. Claude Anderson, author of Black Labor, White Wealth, and Poweronomics, and his latest book, A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. And uh, he wanted to come on tonight and talk some about the exceptionality and uniqueness of black people and also his new initiative he's launching called the Us Too Movement. Okay, Doc, we're back from commercial break. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead. So you said you can't understand why 
uh, many of us want to be lumped into other groups and don't understand uh, the uh, the need for an us too movement. Right. That's absolutely right, Michael. And they need to understand that racism is a competitive relationship where mm-hmm. people are competing for the ownership and control of resources, power, and wealth, and it has nothing in the world to do with being with equality. Black folk are very unique people and special people. That's why every one of my books have tried to tell black folk that you're not progressing in America. It tells you where you are, how you got there, how you've been kept there, and what you've got to do to get out of it. They are special people. And you asked a few seconds ago, Michael, yes, sir. to name some, some, why black folk are considered to be exceptional people. Let, let me just tick off a few. Okay. Maybe about one minute to run. Let me just name some things. You can keep the record if you want to. Okay. First of all, they have to understand that black people are unique like no other people on earth, native blacks, mm-hmm. period. Mm-hmm. The first thing out there, black folk were the first human beings on earth, point one. Mm-hmm. Two, they were the first people in America, and there's a fulsome people. Three, mm-hmm. they're the only people that were based in, in, in enslaved based on skin color. Mm-hmm. Four, that they, they're, they, uh, they're the only group that were classified as property in this country. Mm-hmm. Three-fifths of a human being, equal to a field animal. They're the only people that were denied rights and fruits of their labor and forced to work for 400, almost 460 years without being paid. They were the only people that became the leg of what they call the so-called American dream. One leg was free com- people come to this country as immigrants could get free land and free black labor. They were the only group that were denied the right to own property. They were the only right people that were denied the right to, 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 uh, to uh, have an education. They were the only people that were denied the right to raise a family. They were, they, were the, they were the people upon which the United States Constitution was structured on and the second constitution, which you got the civil rights, was based on black folk getting, getting some relief from slavery. They are the only people that were denied the right to own land and get free land in the country. Right. They are the most patriotic people in the country. They're the only group that has fought in every war for this mother country. Mm-hmm. No other ethnic or racial group can make that claim that they are the most patriotic. Black folk are the most patriotic. They fought in every war from the Revolutionary War up to the present day. No other group has done that. Right. They are the only group that was denied a religion, only group that was every gender, every religious group, Every every ethnic group, every language group has jumped on, exploited, and used and enslaved them around the world. Mm-hmm. They are the only people that produce the music and the dance and the dress and the slang for this country. They are the only people that that, that, that was used for for currency, like the Southern Confederacy ser, ser, uh, conference, uh, conference uh, Confederacy that, that rigged the, uh, their their currency and their and their the, money. The, the, the Confederate States of America, people. the CSA, right. Confederate States of America. That's right. So black folk and black folk are the only people that tri- triggered the Civil War. Mm-hmm. They're the only people that, that, that kept in Jim Crow semi-slavery. But what I'm saying to make those points, sure. therefore, they are exceptional people. Mm-hmm. And the worst thing that can happen to them is what's been going on for, for the last, I guess, about the last 60 or 70 years. Blacks have a historical, Michael, here's my point. Yes. Blacks have a historical and moral claim to their grievances in this country that's supposed to be addressed before, and before any other group. Mm-hmm. Their oppression, their denial, their exclusion needs to be attended to. Blacks have a historical and moral claim on the grievance of this country before any other group. They are the only non-immigrants in the country, and they have. And the worst thing you can do to add insult to injury is to keep trying to equate them to minorities and every every immigrant walking in this country. Right, exactly. <laughs> or to gender groups or bisexual groups. So consequently, in in response to the to the uh, Me Too movement. I said, this is the time. Mm -hmm. This year, 2019, is the time for black folk to stand up and say, we are special people. We're not trying to to be equal to anybody else. We're looking for grievances above that. We're not against anybody, but we're sick and tired of being sick and tired of being overlooked and excluded and being made equal to groups who just walked into the country. Right. Here's the point. 99% of all the black people in America were the direct descendants of slaves. Mm-hmm. They were here before 99% of all the other people in America ever arrived, before they came here from Europe, Asia, Middle East, uh, Latin America. Blacks were, not, blacks were here before all, 99% of all of them ever arrived. So consequently, they must be put into a special category and be in a protected category, just like they, as the, the radical Republicans tried to do in 1865 by putting them into the Freedmen Bureau, saying you are special people. They need to be protected from these immigration laws that keep saying black folk are not equal, are not uh, are beneath them, mm-hmm. and, and any group can come in over them. So therefore, I've said we need to propose a movement across this country in 2019, and this is the last chance blacks going to have to have it. I'm telling you, 
They are being set up across this nation to be put in the same position that the Jews were put in in 1932 in Germany. They're an outgroup. If you were to look at, look at what, was the point, what critical factors existed in 1932 that set the Jews up, those factors now are emerging across this country for black people. They are the official outgroup. They are an official subordinated group. That's why all these immigrants are coming in here and getting rights and privileges and resources over black folk. And they're coming in. If they come in as immigrants, they get five advantages, five points okay. uh, in assets over black folk. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so this year, 2019, must be an exceptional movement, exception movement based on the exceptionality of black folk and saying that we are special people. We're demanding no more begging and marching. We're going to start demanding. We're going to start demanding that we be recognized for our contribution in this country, our appreciated for what we've done, and reparated for what we've done. Black folk were the engines that drove the economic development of this country. Black people were the people that picked the cotton, picked the, the tobacco, the rice, the indigo. They were the ones that engines that drove the development. Mm -hmm. They were the people that built the bridges, the roads, the highways, the, the buildings, the office buildings, the schools and universities across this land. It is, it is immoral and unjust for anybody to equate themselves to black folk. Black folks should say we are above that. So we're not going to tolerate it anymore. Right. And with a 20, with a with an us two movement, we need to learn how to organize across this country, build our own communities, produce our own economy, support our own people, and demand respect and and, and resources. Just like every group that's come to this country has gotten resources that have been denied for black folk for over 460 years. Exactly. Okay, now, Doc, very quickly here. Now, we're coming up on Dr. King Day, January 21st, 2019. And Dr. King is one of our most misunderstood uh, leaders, and, and he's one of the most one of our most distorted. His history is uh, he um, out of uh, all of our leaders, his is one of the most distorted legacies as well. And the problem is is that many of our people, and many other people who speak at Dr. King Day celebrations, really haven't studied Dr. King. Because 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 he was also fighting for economic resources for us, and he was actually he was actually dealing with some of the things you're talking about. Now you deal with it on a whole nother level. Keep, we, we have to keep in mind, Dr. King was assassinated at 39 years old. Okay, mm -hmm. he, he 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 only had 12 and a half years in the movement, and his ideology was evolving. Okay, so his life was snuffed out. His life his life was cut short. But see, people. People misunderstand, and, and I'll, I'll be speaking at Second Baptist Church uh, on Dr. King Day, January 21st. And unfortunately, one of his most misunderstood speeches is called I Have a Dream, which wasn't even the original name of the speech, and the speech wasn't even about a dream. It was about economics, and it was about America giving us a promissory note 100 years prior, and then when we went to cash it at the bank, it was marked insufficient funds. And in the speech, he's talking about addressing the issues, the historic issues plaguing black people in this country. And he's dealing with dismantling white supremacy and racism. Go ahead, Doc. Right, well, you're absolutely right. See, King was a young man in, in, his, in his late 19, in his, in his 20s when he first got involved. 26. In yeah. And so he pretty much picked up the, uh, the prevailing philosophies that had come out of the, uh, out of the, out of the changes that had where the, uh, from the civil rights movement, when it started off, everything was switched and turned upside down, mm -hmm. where black folks' should, first premise should have been addressing, not addressing the purposes of slavery. What, did, what was the primary purpose of slavery? What yes. did, why did it come into existence? Nobody ever addressed that. Mm -hmm. You should say that, that the purpose of slavery was to intentionally maldistribute almost 100% of all this nation's land, businesses, minerals, rights, opportunities, income, and controls of all levels of government away from in the hands of black folk into the hands of whites. That was the primary purpose, but before, but that was that was never addressed. But but because of the uh, but because of the, the civil rights movement, by the time he got into it, the entire pressure was to abandon black folk and give in to the realities of racism. That's why they saw this whole thing about the nine neglect mm -hmm. that came up, and also later the Don pa uh, uh, Moynihan. Uh, right, John right. Patrick Moynihan. Yes, that's right. Moynihan in, in mm -hmm. 1968 says, "Let's let's take the uh, take the folks off of black folk and put on minority children and women, mm -hmm. and that and that and that way black folk would disappear, be made harmless, and also in in unimportant and irrelevant. Even even when I left left the Carter administration in uh, in 1982, 
And uh, when I left, when I left, and, and Reagan came in, first thing he did, he called Haldeman into the office mm-hmm. and told Haldeman, "If you're going to address racial issues in this country, make sure you do two things. First, for, first of all, never say anything negative about black people in the country in public. Make sure you make sure you're well aware of your audience before you speak anything negative about them. And secondly, when you talk in public." Always use very broad and ambiguous terms, euphemism, just like in the Constitution. Right. Never talk about them specifically. Talk about things like minorities and poor folk and people of color nowadays. But in the Constitution, what they, they, the trick they use when they draft the Constitution and enslaved millions of black folk, they use terms of a euphemism like uh, equal to a field animal, three-fifths of a human being, that special kind of property, those who are indebted, those who are in bondage, and all this kind of stuff to make sure you never knew it was black folk. And, and Reagan asked him to keep doing the same thing. But what happened when, 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 when Martin came in, he was they, they were beginning to switch over, and they, and they were not uh, wanting to address resolving the conflict that put black folk into a social bind. They had they owned and practically owned nothing. The same thing that happened when they came out of the Civil, rights, out of the, out of the civil War, when, 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 right. the, when the radical Republicans said in, in the Congress, that there are only two ways blacks can be able to survive in this country. They must either have they must have they either going to be slaves or they're going to be free. But to be free, they must minimally fight. Michael have 40 acres, a mule, and a hundred dollars. And immediately the radicals took over when Johnson got assassinated. No, let's give them nothing. Let's leave them, set them free with no land, no clothes, no tools, no animals, no no health care, no education. They won't they won't be able to compete because we're going to need them again for the South to be able to use them back in the semi-slavery and called Jim Crow segregation and peonage. And right. so, and then w- the same w- thing occurred when Johnson was assassinated or Lincoln was assassinated? When, when Lincoln was assassinated. Okay, all right, go okay. ahead. Lincoln, and, and, but, uh, uh, but Johnson took over and replaced Right, it, right, and became right. And, he gave, and Johnson gave a blanket pardon to the Confederates who, were treason, who committed treason against the country, and he took back most of the land uh, that we were given through uh, 40 acres in a mule and things like this. He took back most of that land and gave it back to the uh, white plantation owners, et cetera. Well, well, well eventually he took, all, took every, 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 every piece of it back. Mm-hmm. What they did is that the only thing blacks got a shot at was a few islands off the coast of the, from the Carolina coast down yeah, to Florida. South Carolina and Georgia. Yeah, yeah, those yeah. Carolina, where the Gullah and the Geechee are. In right. South Carolina, yeah, the Gullah and the Geechee in uh, Atlanta. And right. Georgia. John's, Georgia. Island, John's Island, James Island, mm-hmm. uh, Simon Island, Amelia Island, all those islands, those off coast islands, because whites didn't care that much about it. Blacks got that, but eventually whites took that back. Right. And when the, white, when the whites took back the land after slavery, <clears throat> they said they're going to have to have the labor <clears throat> to be able to work the land. And that's when the, the North cut a deal with the South, say, I'll tell you what, now that the war is over, we've destroyed most of your industries that you all are owning and controlling, you all can have the slaves back. And you can revive, you can re-elevate uh, your land to profitability by uh, just by passing new laws. So they took the, the dependent clause out of the 13th Amendment, which says a person cannot be enslaved unless he's been duly convicted of a crime. And they put out those black codes, the black peonage laws, which which made it possible for whites to use any excuse to back, then re-enslave black folk. Right. And they locked them up for another one. Black codes. Years. The black codes. The black codes. Mm-hmm. Right. The peonage. And so when Martin Luther came in, when they should have focused on trying to again resolve the deep hole that the slavery and Jim Crow segregation had thrown blacks into for, 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 for 460 years, 360 years, and then another 100 years of slavery, semi-slavery, they got blacks. Uh, Martin thought after doing the best he could, but just focused on talking about equality and equal rights and this kind of stuff, what the civil rights laws were supposed to have been talking about in 1865 and 1866 before it was corrupted. Mm-hmm. And he did that. He did the best he could. Let's say from the late 1950s all the way up through the early 60s. And but eventually he began to figure out something was wrong. Right. That's why he started saying that I, I think I'm doing something wrong. I'm I'm a, I'm advocating that black folk run into a burning house. And uh, and so his last speech that he gave for his group, he told him he said one thing I've learned is that you cannot have social integration in this country. I've learned that unless you have economic, I mean, at least you have. Uh, economic integration, and he said you cannot have economic integration until you redistribute some of the resources, wealth, and, and, and power that's been maldistributed into everybody's hands except black folk, and he got killed about three or four months after that. Right. That's what that, that's what people don't understand. So the so the, the the us too movement is trying to address that, saying no, what we want now. I'm not looking for rights anymore mm-hmm. because why not? Because it, what you own and control determines your rights. There you go. Economic power determines your rights and your privileges. You have no rights and privileges unless you have economic well-being. 
So we're going to try to run a new movement across the country. And I need your support and all yes. the major black. Right. Well, you know you have my support. I already told you. But go ahead. Right. Right, and I appreciate that. You always have been. You've always been a very strong country's black man. Thank you. And uh, one of the things that I remember when our last conversation, <laughs> Michael, you said that some blacks said, well, Dr. Anderson must be, he, he, he must be anti-Africa. Right, you know right. Yep, and, yeah, exactly, man. I've heard that. Exactly. Go ahead, go ahead, because you, you, you uh, you're also going to talk about uh, a pan-African agenda for black people. And I right. saw an interview that Dr. Mumbi, M-U-M-B-I, uh, who's from Kenya, did with you you uh, here in the U.S. So talk about that as well. Right, right. See, and what I'm trying to say to black you, you cannot be unique and, and, and say that this country owes you an appreciation and recognition and reparations. Mm -hmm. At the same time, any black coming in any place along with, with Hispanics yesterday or last week or coming from any other part of the world and say they're entitled to it too. You're conflicting yourself because our blackness is, a, blackness is more than skin color. And it, it, it is exceptionality of black folk how they've been mistreated and maltreated for 460 years. It's their exceptionality. It is your badge. It's your honor. It's your code of conduct. But most importantly, Michael, mm -hmm. your blackness is the indebtedness. It symbolizes the indebtedness that this country has to black people, period, native black people, not a black that walks in from, from the Caribbean yet, uh, yet two weeks ago or someone coming from Africa next week. They, 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 do the, they are entitled to be recognized and respected but as immigrants, but black folk are not immigrants. Right. Black people are the only non-guests in America. They're not guests. They didn't, they didn't voluntarily migrate here. They were brought here and mistreated and abused for 460 years. They're entitled. They're entitled to be, to be reparated, recognized, and, rec and appreciated for, for their contribution in building this country. Now, and people say, well, Dr. Anderson, well, how about Africa? Uh, if, you, if, you don't, if you exclude Africans... Yes, I exclude Africans to this degree. We are committed to Africans, so that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a lineage that we have. Mm -hmm. But that lineage, that lineage is peculiar to all human beings because see, every human being on earth, their, their ancestors migrated out of Africa. And I don't care whether you came from Europe or any place on earth. Since the first human being, beings on earth originated south of Kenya in Africa, the first human beings, so anybody who's in a place on this earth, that comes to America can be classified as an African American. And when I do that, I erase and eradicate black folks' uniqueness and exceptionality, and I also I'll erase this country's indebtedness to them by saying, my throat, they use the word African American. So I don't use that word. I use native black Americans. And so when I talked to Mumi that you talked about, she mm -hmm. said, well, how can, can, we, can we do anything with, with Africa? Yes, you can. But you must first learn some basic things in economics. And I, I used to teach in my classes, and I, and I proudly tell people this, and I'm one of the rare people that have had these social economic experiences at all levels of government, at the highest levels in education, economics, politics, and more, everything else. And, I, and I'm running campaigns for mayors, candidates, presidents. And until a black person has those kind of credentials, I don't want to listen to half of them. That's let me tell you what it is. You've got to understand that you can, we can help Africa, but first of all, we can help Africa, we've got to help blacks in America. Right. Drop your bucket where you stand first and fill that before you go into place else. Be like the Jews. Jews right now determine economic policies, social economic policies for all Jews on earth. The Jews in America do. Why? Because they got most of it. They have a concentration of wealth and power in America. Jews in America can control the book industry, the Hollywood uh, and movie industry, uh, the diamond industry, and, uh, and, the, and the banking industry. And they, and they control it, and they use that wealth and power and resources to take care of Jews any place in the world. I want black folk to do the same thing. They'd say, we got a, the blacks, when blacks get enough wealth and power in America, they can then help protect blacks in the Caribbean as well as blacks in Africa. And once, you, once we get that kind of an attitude, that position, we're going we're gonna to go into pan-Africanism. We're going to combine our people, and we're going to start developing a power base. And the problem right now, Michael, is that blacks in America – Right now, only, only own and control one half of 1% of this nation's wealth and power. They do not own more than one half of anything that, is a, that has any high value to it. Where, and the same thing is true in Africa. Africa right now, no blacks are in, throughout Africa, all the entire African continent, blacks over there only own about one half of 1% of anything of value. But so, and, that, and that puts us in a dilemma. But collectively, Collectively, blacks on the earth would be about 24, 25 percent of the world population. Then once we combine our wealth, our, our population, and even though we might still be stuck at one half, one percent, we can start competing as an international, international global uh, uh, team. 
and we begin to compete with all these countries. Because right now what's happening in Africa is that the Europeans are still sucking it dry of all these mineral resources, and now Asians are coming into the country, and Chinese in particular. They're coming in looking for the resources in Africa and to put and putting blacks in puppet roles and as, as officials in government while they extract all the wealth and resources out of Africa, just like they did with blacks in America. When they put, they put a few blacks in an overclass in America and let them dance and sing and tell jokes while blacks, the black masses get nothing. We have, we have no black leadership in America, and they don't have any real accountable black leadership across Africa. But we're going to come together as a team and play as a team. And okay. uh, no, I'm not. I'm very pro-Africa, but uh, but I'm not that Afrocentric. I'm first. I'm Black America centric first, and Afrocentric <laughs> second. <laughs> all right, all right. So, um, and, 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 and oh, oh, I already know you and I already talked. That's for other people. Yeah, uh-huh. you and I, you and and for people to understand, you know, because when he and I, when you and I talk, we go back and forth and we argue things like that. But you know, ninety eight percent of ninety eight percent of the time, we we you know we agree. And, right, and, right. and 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 th- there's some things I say with Doc. Listen to this, and and we go back and forth, and I provide evidence, and then you know at the end of the day, almost everything we agree on. Okay, that's right. Yeah. So that's so right. so, so we so we have to understand that. All right. Now, very quickly here, because we um we only have about 13 minutes left here um in this interview. Um, Michael, you always cut me so short on the time. Well, the time. I mean, we can go back. I have, I have a guest. I have a guest after you, and then we have some technical difficulties. But we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. If you, if you need a little more time, I'll try to steal oh, a couple okay, more okay. minutes from Dr. Paul Finkelman. Okay, <laughs> all right, because I have Dr. Paul Finkelman coming up next. I only have two hours on this network. Okay, but but I'm okay. happy for that because uh, ain't nobody nobody else is crazy enough to give me a, a show. So you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, what, 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 one day we're gonna get we're gonna go back and grab some more of those national chains on the yeah. airways. We're gonna we're gonna get our own radio stations again yeah yeah we, we we have to do that you know and see what's interesting you know just so people understand right um the black radio station that was here that, that in this in this city that doesn't exist anymore right they never offered me a show even though i was on there like for a year with a recurrent segment they never offered me a show even though i pursued it and i was doing national radio and i probably have a larger social media following than anybody doing Radio in Detroit. I got over a million followers on my fan page, the African History Network. Mm-hmm. But they never offered me a show. But we ain't gonna call no names. I just want people to understand <laughs> while I'm here. I, I mean, seriously. And I got forty. I got forty three thousand. I got forty three thousand on my uh, on my YouTube channel. And I don't even use YouTube that much. Okay. So, but but you know, it, it, it's cool. It's all right. Go ahead, Doc. When our movement kicks off, so we're gonna go back and reclaim all that, all that national. Because right now we got twelve thousand radio stations in the United States. And black folk might own about sixty of them. Right. That's, we, should, we should have our fair share of those radio stations. Right. And I see. I had I built a black radio station WWD in Tallahassee, mm-hmm. Florida, back, and I also had one part on the one in W in the top of the Superdome in New Orleans. But that way, those airways belong to black people. Right. Black folks should have a major share of the radio of the twelve thousand radio stations. Out of the five thousand. Uh, television license. Black folks should have a major ownership in those, and out of a t- and we should have daily newspapers. Out of the five thousand daily oop newspaper, we own nothing, and out and out of five thousand, I mean uh, twelve thousand cable systems, we own nothing. See that because we're not getting our fair share. But the, under this us two movement, right. we're gonna have to go back and start. No more begging, no more Martin begging demand. And that's what the Cubans told me a long time ago. Mm-hmm. They said, Doctor, that's the reason we're going to surpass you all in this country is because all you do all do is march and beg. We demand and get. Right. And then I said, you're absolutely right. right. And so oh. – and I, I want you to have your own radio stations when we recapture them under the Us Two movement. Okay. So how do – so what's the next step for the Us Two movement? What what should people do? Well, right, right now is, is – is, well, see, the whole Us Two movement is going to be based on – on, on information. They gotta have the information and solutions. That's why I wrote five books intentionally when I left the government. Mm-hmm. When I left the government with President Clinton and President Carter, I said I'm gonna write books that show black folk exactly how it's done and what they need to do. Books that tell them where they are presently, how they got there, what keeps them there and how to get out. No other books have been written in a series like that, vertically ordered, coinciding with the bottom of black labor, white wealth to show how everything was missing was maldistributed. Right. Those five books right now are being sold as what's called a library pack. It's being on, on the, on the powernomics.com website. Being, so you get all five books with a CD saying, here's what you got to do, and, and here's what we call the in, movement going to be built around. Right. The movement will be built around this educational uh, information and instructions and solutions and, 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 and analysis. 
and that and, and that that's going to be anybody who has not read those books and don't know how to and have no idea what we're talking about. They're going to continue to play. Uh, we're going to be equal to all minorities and poor folk and people of color. Then please don't join the movement. You keep doing what you've been doing for the last <laughs> 460 years because we won't need you. Right. I need blacks that are conscious and committed right. to being blacks. I don't need blacks who want to be double agents and betray their own race and their own people and, 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 and subordinate us in a race. When a race, it, racism came out of a contest, if a football, if there's a horse race or bicycle race or it'll be a race, a race means everybody start out, but you're going to try Whoever gets out front and runs the fastest wins the game. Black folk, if you don't get into a race and try to come in equal. Don't look for no darn equal and equality. Get right. black, every black to learn to get out front and run as fast as he can to get and own and control resources with land and everything else. So, so these books will tell you how we're going to get, get how we're going to strategize and do it. They can go to the Powernomics website and get and sort of order these five books. They have all five books for ninety nine dollars and a DVD. That's going to be the basis. We're going to use that all across America. Is that we got everybody have an understanding what the nature of the problem is with, with the maldistribution of the resources. They'll understand with the power numbers with the national plan. They'll understand that those two dirty little secrets books that tell one thousand stories showing you why black folk are unique and different people, right. different from anybody else. And the last book is called the Black History Reader, one hundred one questions that you never thought to ask would summarize everything, making it humanly impossible for black folk not to come together and recapture those things that they slavery stripped them of. Slavery stripped them of resources and rights, but also more importantly, it stripped them of their social cohesiveness. And my whole effort is to bring blacks, to unite blacks across this country as native black Americans. Then we're going to try to recapture resources. Then we're going to hook up with Pan-Africanism, and we're going to be a major force running from Africa all the way across the world with our 24% population. Okay. Now, uh, very quickly, because uh, we I'm just going to keep going until they tell me to stop. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you mentioned the Folsom people. F-O-L-S-O-M, Folsom Prison is named after them, Folsom, Arizona. Uh, talk about the Folsom people, Folsom, California. Talk about the Folsom people because uh, now you you deal basically with the last five or 600 years of history. I deal with it like the last 50,000 years of history at least and go back before mm-hmm. then. But this was our land. People have to understand this was our land stolen from us. African people were here in this land before anybody else. And this is what... Dr. David M. Hotep deals with in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. But talk about the Folsom people for a minute. Right. Well, see, everybody should know that if black folks are the first human being on earth, it is totally nonsensical, illogical, and stupid for people to think that somehow others, if you're the first, how do you get get in front of the first? You can't get in front of the It's a lot of, the, brother, I travel, I, just like you, I travel across the country. And this year, August 20th, 1619, people c- are going to commemorate Black people coming to this the, the first time we came to this land. I'm like, no, that did happen. August 20, 16, 19, Jamestown, Virginia. We were here for tens of thousands of years before that. But go ahead. <laughs> That's right. But you said the Folsom people, if, and if you look at either one of our books, it'll give you the migration patterns around the world mm-hmm. and how they came in. But uh, but uh, black folk uh, migrated out of Africa up through into the Middle East, Middle East, in turn went over into the to the Asian areas and came and they arrived in the Burbage up in Asia. They crossed the Burbage Straits about five or 6,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. They crossed the Burbage Straits and came into a, to what you might call Alaska in that area. And, they came, and, that, that's, and, they, and they came into that. that I mean, that, that Asians came in that way. But black folk had already entered the country as Folsom people. Some came in their ships and, and, and earlier uh, transportation means came into this country, and they, and they inhabited the area running on the Gulf Coast, like about Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, mm-hmm. and up to California. But when the Asians came in, Asians came in uh, about uh, about 5,000, 6,000 years ago. But those black, the black Folsom people started arriving up here based on some of the records I can find. They, they started arriving about 15 or 16,000 years ago with recorded artifacts, artifacts and, and images in caves and stuff about, five, about 15 or 16,000 years ago, which was 10,000 years before so, so, so-called Asians entered the country. Mm-hmm. When the Asians came across the Burden Space, they came down through Alaska, down through North through Canada, down through North America, then down to that area in, the, in, the, in the New Mexico, Mexico, Arizona, Nevada area, and they, they met and interbred with the Folsom people, who are black people. And that's why that's why this country people don't understand. Well, why are American so-called American Indians? Why, well, they don't have they're not yellow with slant eyes. No, they were dark skinned. Right. They, they, they'd interbred with black people. That they got dark skin, and instead of slant eyes, they got round round eyes. 
right. these people you call them now Native Americans, they're not Native Americans. They're not the Native people. Those are those are those are offsprings of blacks who were here before, that thousands of years before they were. Right. Worked. Okay, Doc. Ho- hold it right there. I- I'm gonna bring you back for a couple minutes to wrap up. Okay. So just, okay. we're up against the mandatory break. Just stand by. I'm Michael M. Hotep, the African History Network show. We're, talk, we're speaking with Dr. Claude Anderson. Uh, we'll be back in a few minutes. And then we'll also be speaking with Dr. Uh, Paul Finkelman, dealing with Thomas Jefferson and slavery. 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the future radio. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right, stand by. We're going to bring Dr. Claude Anderson back for a couple minutes uh, to wrap up and continue talking about the Folsom people, which is extremely important because he deals with the Folsom people as well, who came after the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet, come from southern Africa. They go all around the world. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. And Dr. David M. Hotep, in his book, The First Americans Were Africans, documented evidence. Two did, and a half minutes. Okay, that's cool. Deals with the Khoisan. And the Folsom people come after them, okay? But the Folsom people were here before Native Americans were here. The Folsom people were African people as well, okay? So, so we must understand this was our land stolen from us, okay? So uh, when we talk about black Americans or, or African Americans, and, African, and the term African American was not created by Jesse Jackson in 1988 and 1989. The term African American goes back, the earliest recorded usage is May 15, 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And as another one of my teachers, Professor James Small, talks about who's in the Hidden Colors documentaries. He's in 1804, The Hidden History of Haiti. We're in the Elementary Genocide documentary together from uh, uh, Raheem Shabazz. Um, he says, uh, Professor James Small says, I'm an African American. Africa is my race. America is my geopolitical place. He said, I ain't giving that up for no one. But he, he, but he understands African history African spirituality, he understands black people, etc. Okay, so <clears throat> we are we are all of that, and we must we must understand the difference. And this is not against any immigrants coming to this country. The reason why is is because we must understand white supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other. Okay, the white supremacy pits groups of oppressed people against each other, so they fight one another, so that the one percent or the ten percent stays in power. Okay, so you have when you have uh, people coming from coming through the Mexican border and they're coming from Central America. What what Donald Trump does not want to talk about is many of these people are seeking international political asylum. International political asylum is not illegal. That's international law that the U.S. was involved in crafting. This is why a few months ago, the United Nations blasted the U.S. and said you are violating international law by blocking people at the at the at the designated ports for them to declare international political asylum the trump administration is actually blocking people from doing that but when you study the history you'll see that the that the conditions that many of these people are fleeing from <clears throat> in central america el salvador guatemala things like this these are conditions that the u.s was involved in creating because of uh, many of their policies to Central America going back between 50 to 100 years. And, this, and, and so the U.S. helped to create these conditions that many of these people are fleeing from, and then Trump wants to criminalize them. But he doesn't want to deal with any, he doesn't want to deal with any of that history. He doesn't want to deal with the U.S. involved in the El Salvador, the, the, the 12 year El Salvadorian civil war and the U.S. taking sides. The U.S. Uh, being involved in, I think it was either Guatemala or Honduras, um, assassinating their democratically elected leader in 1954. There's an article that goes deep into um, that history. I'll try, to, I'll try to find it here in just a minute. How much more? 15 seconds. Okay, 15 seconds. Okay, you get Dr. Paul Finkelman on the phone. Just let them know we're running a couple of minutes late, okay? Mm-hmm. Dr. Paul Finkel. That's, that's cool. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Uh, we're speaking with Dr. Claude Anderson uh, right now, and then in a few minutes we're going to be joined by Dr. Paul Finkelman, who is uh, who will be speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History Tuesday, January 15th, 6 p.m., and we'll talk about Thomas Jefferson and slavery. Thomas Jefferson and slavery. Okay, so uh, during the break, those uh, watching me on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, where well, you got a, a, an additional history lesson, but uh, Dot, 
right before the break, you were talking about the Folsom people, okay? Um, go ahead and, and finish that up. We got a couple more minutes and tell people where did the Folsom people come from in Africa also? Uh, m- most, of them, most of them came from, uh, from uh, West Africa there. And then, uh, and then uh, I guess we called them West Africa, but mm-hmm. and then and, and into the United States, and they used their own boats, and then they, and, they, and most of them landed around the Gulf area initially, and then they spread out from the Gulf from the Gulf through up 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 to California up to California, because initially Florida, for instance, Florida ran from Jacksonville uh, all the way over to Texas, and that had whole area, Louisiana te- Gulf area. Right. Then they moved into Arizona, New Mexico, and then to California, and Nevada. That's why you got. Nevada, Folsom, Folsom counties, Folsom territory, California, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, mm-hmm. and those other facts. Others went down into into Mexico. At that time, it wasn't called Mexico. Mexico was called New Spain in those days. And the first, as a matter of fact, the first people they, they, they had Spain brought in about three to four million blacks into Mexico to pick the, to, the, to dig for gold, silver, and special coin, special stones. Right. And so. But anyway, but that's but the folks people came in. Everybody's mixing mixing bread with them, and now they call them Native Americans, which is something different from black folk. But they are still they descend the black folk. So the only people if you're going to recognize anybody, you better recognize the black folk. And that should be done through the 1866 Indian treaties mm-hmm. that went out that tried to recapture that. And but to, but to make a long story short, I know your time is running out. But I'm going to let you know that this folks this YouTube movement will hopefully uh, kick off. This is the beginning of. We're going to run through through starting for with February. And tell black folks to start standing up and proclaiming their, uni- their uniqueness that nobody in this nation has been mistreated, maltreated, excluded, and subordinated the way blacks have. And blacks have a moral obligation. This nation has a moral obligation and a commitment to put the emphasis on putting black, raising blacks up and giving them all the resources, the things that were denied to them by slavery, Jim Crow, semi-slavery. And to put them in, if you're going to keep bringing in immigrants, put, them in, put blacks into a protected class. So none of those immigrants come to this country should be able to compete with black folk and take away resources that black folk should be getting and be gaining and recapturing for all, to make up for those 460 years they were denied. And then that movement been kicking off and we'll consider people like yourselves across this nation to help us with it. And then you can always uh, tell, tell all your listeners to go to powernomics.com and buy, those, buy that library pack and start reading those books. We're going to have a major movement. This is it for us. We're going to fight and stand up and demand rights, recognition, and reparations, and appreciation for all the things we've done for this nation that none of these immigrants have done. Every white in this country and every Arab and every Asian and every Latino, they, they, were, they are the descendants of slaveholders. Every race, language group, religious group, gender group on earth has enslaved and profiteered and exploited black folk. So they can't not come in here now to try to equate themselves to black folk. And then they say, we're equal to y'all. We're all minorities and people of color. Right. No, you're not. Black folk are special people, and I call them, call yourselves exceptional people from this point on in the, in these, uh, in the U2 movement, Us uh, 2 movement. The Us 2 movement, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so, um, okay, so once again, visit his website, powernomics.com, powernomics.com, and uh, he has the uh, five-book uh, uh, bundle pack there as well. And then, uh, and then he'll he'll have we'll have him back also here on the show to give more information about the Us Two movement. Oh, oh, Doc's gone. Doc, you still there? Hello? Oh, okay, Hello? okay. I guess we lost Dr. Claude Anderson. Okay, all right. So we have Dr. Paul Finkelman. Dr. Paul you Finkelman. Do. Okay, all right. How you? how you doing, Dr. Paul Finkelman? You all right? I am fine. I am fine. Okay, excellent, excellent. Okay, so this is Michael M. Hotel. Host of the After History Network show. Glad you made it in uh, to Detroit safely. And uh, very quickly here, I didn't. I, I knew you were on the line, but I didn't know uh, you were on the air. Uh, very quickly, Dr. Paul Finkelman uh, will be speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History uh, coming up Tuesday, January fifteenth, two thousand nineteen, six p.m. to seven thirty p.m. So last month we had uh, uh, Vice President of Programming Charles Farrell uh, here on the air, and I told you Charles is going to be back every month. Uh, to talk about the events coming up, and he he, he talked uh, some about Dr. Paul Finkelman coming to speak about Thomas Jefferson and slavery. So very quickly, Dr. Paul Finkelman is the president of Gratz College. Um, he is the author of more than 200 scholarly articles and more than 50 books. He is a specialist on American legal history, U.S. constitutional law, race and law, American Jewish history, the law of American slavery, 
the First uh, Amendment, Religious Liberty, the History of the Second Amendment, African American History, the American Civil War, and a whole lot more. Okay, <laughs> and uh, and if you, you when you hear me talk some about the um, history of the three fifths compromise, he has a fantastic article that everyone, every, I do mean everyone, needs to read. Is at the root dot com called the three fifths clause? Why its taint persists? Because our whole understanding of the three fifths compromise and us thinking that Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution said that black people were three-fifths of a human being is, is a total misunderstanding. So we want to welcome to the African History Network show Dr. Paul Finkelman. How are you doing tonight? I am fine. I got into Detroit about uh, 7.15. Okay. I actually got here early, which is always unusual. Oh, that's good. I had, a, I had a wonderful dinner at the St. Regis Hotel. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Fabulous gumbo. As good as what I used to get when I lived in Louisiana. Okay. I'm delighted to be here. All right. Excellent. Excellent. Well, look, you you are the author of, of a number of books, but um, uh, the one pertaining to Thomas Jefferson that you're going to talk about uh, Tuesday at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History is Slavery and the Founders, Race and Liberty, R- Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. Slavery and the Founders, Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. And you, you're also the uh, writer of an excellent article for the New York Times that I've talked about here on this show. And when we had uh, Charles Farrell here last month, he talked about it. It's called The Monster of Monticello, The Monster of Monticello, which is about Thomas Jefferson. So what, what, should, uh, what should we know about Thomas Jefferson and slavery? Well, I think the first thing to know is that he lived with slavery from – Virtually the moment he is born mm-hmm. until the day he dies, he comes from a family of wealth that would be impossible for most people to comprehend today. Um, slaves are at the center of his world in terms of um, in, 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 in terms of his um, of his life. I mean, his his lifestyle, his wealth, right. his power are all about slavery and this and so that's one piece of it. Second piece is he of course writes the Declaration of Independence, mm-hmm. says we're all we're all created equal and we're endowed with the rights of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And so you would think, well any man who could write those words can't be in favor of slavery because how could you be in favor of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness and own other people? But Thomas Jefferson doesn't have any problem with this inconsistency. He doesn't have any problem with what the rest of us might call a kind of hypocrisy. And so he spends his whole life as a slave owner. Uh, there are all kinds of myths about him. People people tell, will tell me, well, he freed all his slaves, didn't he? And the answer is no. <laughs> um, and uh, for you know, for two centuries – People talked about his relationship with Sally Hemings, right? And the and the um, the defenders of Jefferson always said, "Well, Mr. Jefferson wouldn't do something like that." I I, I remember being at a conference, <coughs> excuse me, okay. being at a conference at the University of Virginia, mm-hmm. and I and I said something about the the proof of for, for Jefferson being the father of Sally's kids was very strong, and this woman tells me, well, we must give Mr. Jefferson the benefit of the doubt. And, and I said, I'm a historian. I don't give anybody the benefit <laughs> of the doubt. I look at the evidence. Right, right. Now, what is some of the evidence? And you've been also to the Monticello Plantation as well, which is which is Thomas yeah, Jefferson's right. plantation. Go ahead. Yes. And, okay, so here's, here's the most important evidence. Okay. We know that Sally Hemings has at least five children. Okay. All right. Right. Whether she has more, we don't know. There's some people who said she did. Hold on a second. Somebody okay. at my door. All right. No problem. There's... No problem. Oh, so, so Sally Hemmings had at least five children. Now, in an excerpt from his article, The Monster Monticello, he talks about how uh, rather than encouraging his countrymen to liberate their slaves, he opposed both, both private manumission and public emancipation. Even at right. his death, Thomas Jefferson failed to fulfill the promise of his rhetoric 
His will emancipated only five slaves, all relatives of his mistress, Sally Hemings, and condemned nearly 200 others to the auction block. Are you back, uh, Dr. Uh, Finkelman? That's, that's me. That's me. That's okay. me writing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. That's the monster of Monticello. That's his article for the New York Times. Go ahead. Right. Okay. So here's the thing about Jefferson and, and Sally. Mm -hmm. well, because Jefferson's such a prominent man, we know where he is most of the time. Right. You know, we have a record that he's in Washington, he's in Virginia, he's here, he's there. What we know is that every one of Sally's children was born nine months after Sally and Tom were in the same place. Okay. okay. So if Thomas Jefferson is in Washington for 11 months, mm -hmm. Sally doesn't have any children in that 11-month period, right? Okay. Thomas Jefferson comes back to Monticello, and uh, nine months later, <laughs> Sally has a baby. Right. Uh, you know, it doesn't take, it doesn't take a rocket science just to figure out, one, that Sally is not having sex with somebody else. Okay. Thomas is there. Okay. Because she's not having children nine months. She's not having children unless Thomas was there nine months earlier. Okay. And that she clearly is having children nine months after Thomas is there. Now, here's the length that with which people who defended Thomas Jefferson would go. They would say, well, it was his nephew or mm -hmm. it was his uncle. And, and you know, so then what you'd have to believe is this. Ta imagine Thomas Jefferson riding in a buggy all the way from Washington to, to Western Virginia. It takes him two, three days. He gets there. He's all hot and tired. And the first thing he does is he says, hey, I'm glad I'm back in Monticello. Go, uh, Go send a message to my uncle that he can come over and play with Sally tonight. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is not plausible. Uh, so, so this is the evidence that we had, and then along comes the DNA. Okay. And the DNA evidence is interesting because because what the DNA scientists have discovered is that the Jeffersons, the male Jeffersons, had a very peculiar, particular gene. Hmm. That is extremely rare and almost never found in anybody else except male Jeffersons. And we know this because there are descendants of Thomas Jefferson and his wife. So we know who are descendants of, of, of Jefferson. And so once they discovered this gene, a couple of people stepped forward who claim that they are the descendants of Thomas Jefferson. Okay. One of them, an African-American man living in Richmond, has this exact gene. Um, now, you know, now I'm, I'm, hearing some, I'm hearing some background noises. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was doing – I'm terribly sorry. It's okay. So one of them has, has this, this, this exact gene. Okay. So the evidence is, is very clear that if this guy has the gene, it is because somewhere back in his ancestry, there's a Jefferson. Okay. And this man says, I trace my ancestry back to Sally Hemings. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, uh, it's hard to trace your ancestry 200 years ago. We right. don't have locked records. Right. But, you know, I mean, my, my grandparents all came from Europe around 1900, I can't trace my ancestry back past my great-grandparents. Okay. You know, I don't know, I don't know who, who, you know, my great-great-grandparents were. I, mean, I have no records. Right. Uh, the, the, all the, the, there weren't any records, and if there were, they were all destroyed by the Nazis. And so, you know, I don't have these records. So, so I can understand that, that it's hard to trace ancestry 200 years. Right. But this guy comes along and says, hey, look, here's the family Bible. Here's the family Bible going all the way back to Sally Hemings' son. Mm. And guess what? I've got the same gene as Thomas Jefferson's descendants from his wife, from his white wife. Right. So, so let me ask you this so, question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead and finish your thought. So, so, so the bottom line is this. Um, the third president of the United States fathered children 
with his slave. Mm -hmm. And um, that's something Americans have to come to terms with, one way or the other. Right, exactly. Now, um, I know you haven't seen the Jefferson exhibit that's traveling around, but you you have been to the Monticello Plantation, which is like, it's been turned basically into like a museum, hasn't it? Um, well, it, it's it, look, it's a spectacularly interesting and beautiful house. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it, Jefferson was an architect. Right. He designed the house himself. Jefferson's a brilliant man. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he has this wonderful house, and he owned lots and lots of land. By the way, it was not the only plantation he owned. Right. He had another plantation in Virginia. Mm-hmm. And he owned lots of slaves. He owned a couple of hundred slaves. Right. Um, By the way, my my take on Jefferson Mm -hmm. as a a figure in American history, that it's not about whether he had children with his slaves. Okay. I think what it's about is that here is a man who writes the Declaration of Independence, who tells us that we're all created equal, and who is the one man in the moment – who could have done something to begin to deal with slavery, and he refuses. I'll tell you a quick story. Okay, and then we got uh, three minutes before the break, but we'll hold you over a couple minutes also. But go ahead, start the story. Uh, maybe I can do my three-minute story. Okay. It's like the two-minute drill in football. Okay. Uh, in 1816, a, uh, a man named Edward Coles, decides to free his slaves. Coles has inherited these slaves. He didn't buy them. His father died, left him about 20 slaves. Coles is a neighbor of Thomas Jefferson. He knows Jefferson. Coles had been James Madison's private secretary. He writes to Jefferson a letter, and he says, I've read your Declaration of Independence. I've read everything you've said about liberty, and I've decided that I should free my slaves because of you. And... Now that you're no longer in politics, now that you're no longer running for office, don't you think it would be a good idea if you endorsed what I'm doing and encouraged other people to end end slavery, you know, to free their slaves? Right. And Jefferson writes back a letter in which he says, um, <clears throat> he said, I've been waiting for those who were raised on the mother's milk of liberty. I mean – now, how can you not like a guy who can write like that, right? Right. A mother's milk of liberty to come into their own and deal with this problem of slavery. And if you read the first half of this letter, you think Jefferson's going to say, yeah, free your slaves. Everybody should free their slaves. He writes like this for about two pages. Mm-hmm. And then he says, but I don't think you should free your slaves mm. because he says black people are pests. On society. That's the word he used, pests. Right, right, right. They are pests on society, and we should not have free black people. And he said, you should keep your patrimony. That is, you should keep the inheritance from your dad. <laughs> you should not free these people. Absolutely. And, 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 and people should read some of the negative things that Thomas Jefferson said about African Americans. I know in Now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder, he mentions that. You deal with that also in your book, Slavery and the Founders, Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. Um, we're coming up on a, a break. Uh, uh, how much more, How much time we have before the break? Oh, okay, okay. So uh, I'm going to hold you over. When we come back, I want you to talk for two or three minutes to explain the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, which is Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, because it's t- most people totally misunderstand um, what it said, yeah. what it's about, and also don't realize that Section 2 of the 14th Amendment of 1868 corrected it as well, 151 years ago. So stand by. We're coming up on a break, Dr. Finkelman. Uh, you listen to the African History Network show, 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. I'm Michael M. Hotep, and Dr. Paul Finkelman will be at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History Tuesday, January 15th, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. It's free and open to the public. He will be speaking on Thomas Jefferson and slavery and doing the book signing, book signing as well. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, guys. <clears throat> you don't want to miss this next because people misunderstand the Three-Fifths Compromise uh, uh, 1787, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 in the U.S. Constitution. 
I just had Dr. Claude Anderson on. I ain't have time to get into it and try to help him. The U.S. Constitution did not say we were three-fifths of a human being. That's a total misunderstanding. And we haven't read it and don't understand what apportionment means. Okay? It says for the purpose. I, I carry a copy, copy of the Constitution everywhere I go. You can go to loc.gov. We're going to post an article here. Uh, the three-fifths compromise, why its taint persists. Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution says, Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned. Representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among several states, which, which may be included within the Union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, and excluding Indians not taxed three-fifths of all other persons. People focus on three-fifths of all other persons and think it's saying three-fifths of a human being and never talk about what does representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned means. You have to understand what apportioned means and apportionment. We'll deal with that on the other side when we come back. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation of Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, January 13, 2019. Hey, be sure to visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. We have a 48-hour sale going on right now. We have 50% uh, off on a lot of our DVD bundle packs, uh, including the Africans who were here before Columbus, the Africans who were here before Columbus. That's an eight-DVD uh, bundle pack right now. It's on sale, $50. It includes a double lecture I did with Dr. David M. Hotep, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence. It has, uh, has a lecture from um, Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, dealing with They Came Before Columbus. One uh, lecture from uh, Dr. Um, John Henry Clark as well. Then also uh, we have the eight digit, the Black Panther 8 Digital Download Bundle Pack. The Black Panther 8 Digital Download Bundle Pack. Uh, it's on sale. $30, regularly $80 it includes... Uh, three of my lectures dealing with the film Black Panther, five of my other presentations also. You can also donate to the African History Network at paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, or visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com if you don't have a PayPal account, and that helps us to keep doing the research, to sell the DVDs, our online courses, uh, the donations that helps us to keep doing the research. Stay on the air, pay the bills, et cetera, okay, because it takes a lot of work and a lot of research to do each one of these shows. Okay, we're speaking with Dr. Paul Finkelman, who is the uh, who, who will be speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, Tuesday, January 15th, 2019, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. He's going to be speaking on Thomas Jefferson and slavery, treason against the hopes of mankind. He's the author of the book Slavery and the Founders, Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. He's also the writer of a fantastic article for the New York Times called The Monster of Monticello, which talks about Thomas Jefferson, and uh, he will be doing a book signing as well. Okay, so Dr. Paul Finkelman, uh, you, you, you also wrote a fantastic article for TheRoot.com that I cite all the time, and my listeners are familiar with it. It's called Three-Fifths Clause. Why its taint persists. Three fifths clause. Why its taint persists, which deals with the real history of what's known as the Three Fifths Compromise of 1787. So please explain it to us, and why do so many people misunderstand what it says? Okay, so everybody tighten their seat belts because you're going to get a lecture in constitutional law, and yes. it's sometimes confusing. Mm -hmm. Start with this: at the Constitutional Convention. The delegates are trying to decide how you allocate representatives in Congress. Yes, that apportionment. Is, how, many, how, how many members of the House of Representatives will each state get? Yes. And they decide it should be based on population. And that's, that's the democratic way of doing it. Mm -hmm. The next question is, who do you count in the population? Right. The Northerners, who are either... Got, have gotten rid of slavery, like Massachusetts, where there is no slavery anymore, mm -hmm. or are getting rid of slavery, like Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. where they have a law which says that no one can be born a slave, so all people born in Pennsylvania will be born free, right. and slavery will literally die out. They say <laughs> that you cannot count slaves 
for representation because slaves are not voters. They're not part of the political process. And they remind the Southerners that every time there's been a discussion about slavery in the past, the Southerners have all said, these aren't people. This is our property. Right. You know, slaves are property. And so the Northerners say, well, you know, I mean, one Northerner mocks them and says, well, if, if you can count your slaves for representation, why what, can't we count our sheep and horses? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if it's property, it's property. And the Southerners said, oh, no, no, these are people. We have to count them for people. Right. And so what it is, in part, it's a debate about morality. You know, one representative from one of the delegates in Pennsylvania says that um, that this is obscene because what you're doing is encouraging people from South Carolina to go to Africa and kidnap slaves and bring kidnap black people, bring them to the United States, mm-hmm. make them slaves, and then they'll get more representatives in Congress right. because they'll have more slaves. Right. And they say, we can't do this. And the Southerners say – um, the slaves produce wealth, they're part of the economy, and therefore we should get representation for them in Congress. Mm-hmm. And ultimate, ultimately what they decide is that you'll count the slaves at a three-fifths ratio. Right. So if uh, – let's suppose you got a state – Let's suppose they say you got one representative for every 100,000 people in your state, and you have a state with 500,000 slaves and 500,000 free people, right? Right. You get five representatives for the 500,000 free people, and you get three representatives, three-fifths for the 500,000 slaves. Right. Okay? Now, here's where, where it gets confusing. Mm-hmm. If you are anti-slavery, if you don't like slavery – then you don't want ca- to count slaves at all for representation. Right. You, you want to, the, co- the Constitution to say representation will be based on the whole number of free people, period. End of story. Mm-hmm. And if you are a southern slave owner, you want to count all the slaves for representation. Right, exactly. That's what they want to do. And they're going back and forth debating this to determine how, how to count them. You know, some are saying let's count half the population. Some are saying let's count three quarters of the population. Go ahead and let people know what actually how, what ended up happening. That's right. And, and that's so the debate is about um, whether or not you count slaves for representation. In the end, the Southerners get a big victory. Right. Because they get to count their slaves three fifths, mm-hmm. which means that the more slaves they have, the more votes in Congress they have. But the slaves don't get the vote. They're not counted at all. Right. Um, and the misunderstanding, the misunderstanding is that this is about race. That is that the convention is saying that a black is a three-fifths of a person. And that's not what they're saying because, remember, the people who oppose slavery won't count slaves at all for representation. Right. You, 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 the, the northerners, basically the northerners. Yeah, and, Right. That's right. And the Southerners who love slavery, mm-hmm. they want to count slaves fully for representation. Right. It's not about the personhood of the slave. It's about how much power right. the, South, the South gets versus the North. And, and, and very quickly here, um, that, so we're referring to Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution. And I just want to read it here briefly so people understand what we're talking about. Because the key word is apportioned. The key word is a portion, which determines how do you determine how many seats in the House of Representatives a particular state has, okay? So so, so we'll, we'll have. So people can go to loc.gov, which is the Library of Congress website, and you can read, a, uh, read the U.S. Constitution there for free. Or you can go to archives.gov, archives.gov, which is the National Archives. You can read it there for free also. And the uh, uh, Trump's government shutdown uh, does not mean that that website's not working. It's still working. But, here, but here's what it says. Representatives and direct taxes, representatives and direct taxes shall be apportioned among the several states which may be included within the union according to their respective numbers, which shall be determined by adding to the whole number of free persons, the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians 
not taxed three-fifths of all other persons, persons with a capital P. Okay, so w- once again, people misinterpret that. And I've heard, I've heard attorneys say the U.S. Constitution said that black people are three-fifths of a, of a human being. That's not what that is saying. Go ahead, Doc. And, and, by the way, by this time, there's a growing number of free blacks in the North. Mm-hmm. We're talking 1787. We're talking about 1787. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's right. And they're counted as a whole person because they're free. Right, right. And they can vote also. You're going to have a lot of, you're going to have someone who can vote as well. That's right. So here's the great irony. After the Civil War, and remember, there's only one reason for the Civil War, to protect slavery. Right. The Civil War is about slavery. It is not about states' rights. Mm -hmm. It is not about the northern economy oppressing the southern economy. It's about creating a country where slavery will be protected forever. Right. And the vice president of the Confederacy says slavery is the cornerstone of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. And if you also, and very quickly, if you also read the statements of secession, from the 11 states that secede from the Union, they tell you how crucial slavery is to their wealth and their way of life and, and that they're fighting to maintain it also. South right. Carolina says we're seceding from the Union because a man's been elected president who believes that slavery should be put on the road of ultimate extinction. Mm-hmm. That's Lincoln. Lincoln, right. Okay, so, okay, so after the Civil War... The South is going to get more representation in Congress than it had before the war. Right. Because now all the slaves are free. Mm-hmm. And so and so the irony of this is that these southern pro-slavery traders are actually going to have more political power than they had before the war. Right. Right. Because 90 percent, 90 percent of black people live in the South, basically, after the Civil War That's ends. It. Right. And, and and as late as 1900. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Before the Great Migration. Yes. Yeah. And 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 by the way, to this day, a majority of African Americans live in the South. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because we're moving back because of gentrification up north. <laughs> well, well, but but the fact is that there has been no time mm-hmm. when a majority have not lived in the South. Yeah. That is. There is no time when the majority of African Americans live outside the former fifteen slave states. Right. Right. So, so, so this is the great irony. So it is not a statement about racial equality. It's a fight over power. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's the one further irony. Go ahead. The president is elected by something called the Electoral College. Right. The Electoral College was based on counting the number of representatives you had in Congress mm-hmm. to determine how many electoral votes you got. So right. this crazy system whereby uh, a candidate with the most votes doesn't get elected president. And it's happened twice in my lifetime. Al Gore and Hillary Clinton both got more votes than the guy who won. Right. That's because of the Electoral College, and the Electoral College was created for slavery. When they're debating how to choose the president, Mm -hmm. James Madison, the, 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 the father of the Constitution, says... The best thing would be for the people to elect the president. And then he says, but one of the problems with that is our Negroes won't count. Right. I.e., we won't get any power for our slaves. Mm -hmm. Right. So so we're still stuck with this last horrible vestige of slavery called the Electoral College. Exactly. So it was uh, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, if I remember, right? The, The two that created the Electoral College. Actually, Hamilton's not not even not there much. He's not involved. Okay, it's other people. It, it was too, but it was. Go ahead. Madison's the one who suggested, and he makes right. it very clear. I'm suggesting this because this way, we are going to get more votes for the president, because we're going to count our slaves mm-hmm. in terms of these electors. Right. Not that the slaves can vote. Right. Right. But that they, that, yeah. So yeah, that's our history. Right. So so, we, so we're still talking about 1787. And this is uh, at the Philadelphia Convention, basically the spring of 1787, where they're debating what should be in the Constitution, what should be taken out, things like this. Um, mm-hmm. So then Section two of the 14th Amendment of 1868 corrects how the count is taking place in 
uh, dealing with the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787, Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's correct. And so, and so the, what the 14th Amendment says, mm-hmm. and it's, it's long, so I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to read it all. Okay. I'm gonna summarize it. Sure. But basically, what it says is this: that if the states don't allow equal franchise, they will have their representatives in Congress reduced by the percentage of the people that aren't allowed to vote. Yes, absolutely. And yeah. once again. People can go to LOC.gov, which is the Library of Congress website, or archives.gov. Those are two free sources that I can give you right now. And just search for U.S. Constitution. You can read that. That's Section 2 of the 14th Amendment. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I was going to say you, you could probably just Google U.S. Constitution text. Sure. And you'll get all sorts of opportunities. Yep. You don't even have to go to those websites. Yep, you could do that also. Absolutely. So, so, so what we end up with is is a system that is designed to protect slavery. Right. It's designed to make slavery more powerful and to embed it in the Constitution. Exactly. And and to and to eliminate the electoral college, then that that takes uh, to amend to to um, create a constitution amendment. It has to pass. Uh, both the House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate by a, a two-thirds majority vote, and then it has to be has to be ratified by three quarters of the state legislatures. Also, that's right. So, so people people have to understand it, you have to vote, okay? Because <laughs> it's not just the House of Representatives and the Senate; it's also your your, your members of the the state House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate. They vote. Go ahead, and the governor. And the governor, and the mayor, and the mayor. Mm-hmm. So, so explain explain that process quickly if you have a couple minutes. Explain that um, to rat to actually ratify the three the, the to actually ratify. I'm sorry to actually amend the constitution and eliminate the electoral college because a lot of people say you know half the people who say don't vote say we need to get rid of the electoral college, right? But but if you could go ahead and just explain that a little bit more for a couple minutes if you don't mind. Sure. So the way you change the Constitution is by an amendment, and the amendment is done by the House of Representatives or the Senate proposing it. Mm -hmm. You have to have a two-thirds vote in both the House and the Senate. Right. Right. And then you have to have three-quarters of the states vote to ratify the amendment. Mm -hmm. It's a very hard process. Right. but But it could be done. Right. And... And it's a question of whether or not uh, the people are going to go out and vote. Uh, I mean, right. the, 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 the bottom line is that people get cynical. Mm-hmm. And they say, well, I don't love this candidate, right. so I'm not voting. Right. I don't think this candidate is perfect, so I'm not voting. Well, let me tell you, nobody's perfect. Right. Exactly. exactly. Nothing is perfect. The question is... Do you want better or do you want worse? Right. And, and, and we need to look at their issues, their policies, and see how their policies match yeah. up with our agenda, match up with our issues, what we're concerned about also. Um, very quickly here, and then, and then I'm, I'm going to let you go because I know you just got into town. Um, you said the mayor and the governor also. Uh, what, what role do they play in uh, amending the Constitution? Well, the governor, of course, has power – to help influence the state legislature. Okay, right, right. right. The mayor, the mayor runs your town. He runs your city. And in, in other words, every part of our government mm-hmm. works for us if we elect them. Right. Okay. And and, and, and and hold them accountable. Also, not just elect them and go to sleep, but keep our foot on their neck and hold them accountable. Well, either keep our foot on their neck or just talk to them. Yeah. And say this is what I want. Right. Uh, I, I mean, you know, we have this idiotic shutdown right now, right? Right. Right. You know, where Trump has shut down the government because he can't have his way on one thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he's 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 acting like a five year old. Right. You know, if I can't get my way, I'm going to have a temper tantrum. Right. Exactly. The only, the only way that's going to change is when enough members of Congress including Republicans, hear from enough people 
in their districts, in their state, that I'm hurting, I'm in pain, I'm suffering. Mm -hmm. You have to pass this budget and reopen the government. I mean, I, I went I went to two airports today, right? Right, All right. All these PSA workers are not getting paid. Exactly. You know, they're working for free, and they've been ordered to go to work. They've said if you don't show up to work, you'll get fired, you know, when the – when the shutdown is over. Right. So these people are going to work without getting paid. Um, that's just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. And and our elected leaders have to hear that we, the people, don't want that. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, exactly. And, 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 it, and it's all about, um, well, you know, I don't want to get too political, mm -hmm. but it's it, it's about our, our, our child in the White House. Right, exactly. Oh, he's a child. I I, I call him uh, Donald Trump, the, 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 the dummy deceitful dictator. The dummy deceitful mm -hmm. dictator. He's the first Russian president of the United States. If you read the article from the New York yeah. Times that came out Friday and then the follow-up one from the Washington Post Saturday, oh, he's the first Russian president of the United States. But <laughs> but look, Doc, uh, go ahead and finish your last statement and not have to run. But in the end, it's about people being involved in the political process. It's about people voting. Yes. And it's about and it's about people making a decision that I'm not going to get the perfect person. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get the best I can get. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. You know. Uh, by the way, we make these decisions all the time. We go out and we want to buy a car. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get the car we really like because it costs too much money. We're going to get the car we can get. Right, right. <laughs> you know, uh, and and we we make we accept less than perfection mm -hmm. all the time, and then you hear people say, "Well, I'm not voting because it doesn't matter who gets elected." Well, it does matter. Oh, absolutely. Pol politics impacts every aspect of our life, and politics is the legal distribution of scarce wealth, power, and resources, and the writing of laws, statutes, ordinances, amendments, and treaties their adoption, interpretation, and enforcement. So that's extremely important. Okay, uh, look, Doc, I got to run. I will see you Tuesday, uh, 6 p.m. Yeah. 6 p.m. at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, uh, January uh, 15th, 2019. It's free and open to the public. Come on out. Uh, you it, can uh, it is, go ahead. It is, but the, I should add yeah. that, there are, that there are limited seats. Okay. And so people should call up the museum and, and make a reservation. Oh, they want you. They want people to make a reservation. Okay, all right. I, be, I believe so because the, I, I'm I'm actually looking at the poster and it doesn't say that, but I know that there's you know that there are limited seats, so okay, you know, they only have so many chairs. Okay, all right, no problem. Well, it's in the General Motors Theater, uh, but okay, all right. Um, okay, so uh, once again, uh, very quickly, how can if somebody wants to bring in to do a lecture, anybody has questions, how can they get in contact with you? The easiest way uh, is uh, uh, I, I'll give you my easy email address. It's sure. President, mm -hmm. P-R-E-S-I-D-E-N-T, President at Gratz, G-R-A-T-Z dot E-D-U. Okay. I'm president of Gratz College. It's a small college in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, been, I've been a history professor and a law professor my whole life. Right. Uh, and now I'm suddenly a college professor. A Absolutely. President, like president at Gratz.edu. Okay, no problem. Well, look, I will see you Tuesday, and you have a great night, Dr. Paul Finkelman, okay? I look forward to meeting you. Thank no problem. You. Bye. Take care. All right, so that's Dr. Paul Finkelman. He is the uh, author of uh, Slavery and the Founders, Race and Liberty in the Age of Jefferson. He's also the uh, writer of um, a fantastic article for the New York Times called The Monster of Monticello, The Monster of Monticello, M-O-T-I-C-E-L-L-O. That's at the New York Times that deals with the history of Thomas Jefferson and slavery. And uh, he'll be speaking at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History, uh, dealing with Thomas Jefferson and slavery. He will be doing a book signing as well. Uh, there'll be questions and answers, uh, 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. in the General Motors Theater, okay? I don't have the number for the museum in front of me. Look it up, okay? Go to the right.org, the right.org, W-R-I-G-H-T, the right.org, all right? And you got a real history lesson dealing with the history of the Three-Fifths Compromise of 1787 because I've heard attorneys, I've heard some African-American attorneys just totally misstate what the Three-Fifths Compromise says, okay? All right. 
uh, very quickly before. Uh, so uh, some of these stories I can't get to. Uh, next week we'll deal with um, the segment from Roland Martin dealing with uh, uh, our immigrants taking our uh, jobs. Uh, you can go to YouTube.com and uh, look at the uh, look at the segment called uh, what is it called? Are they taking our jobs or something like that? Yeah, are are they taking our jobs? I think is the name of that. So, yeah, are they taking our jobs? Trump claims illegal immigration hurts blacks during fear mongering speech from January 9th, 2019. Go watch that at YouTube.com, Roland Martin on YouTube, Roland Martin on YouTube. We'll deal with that next week. But I want to get to this story right here. So this past week, uh, January 8th, uh, we, we heard that um, a criminal investigation has been launched in Georgia, dealing with, dealing with one Robert Sylvester Kelly, also known as the Pied Piper of R&B. Uh, News1.com, CNN has articles dealing with R. Kelly reportedly under criminal investigation. Uh, and you, you have, uh, let's see here, uh, the Griot.com also has an article dealing with um, uh, Kim Fox, uh, Cook County State Attorney Kim Fox in uh, Illinois is asking for people to come forward. She said uh, uh, just days after Lifetime aired a scathing docuseries about unchecked sex abuse, by R. Kelly at his home in Chicago. The city's top prosecutor said Tuesday that she has been in touch with families who claim the singer is holding their loved ones captive. During an afternoon news conference at her downtown office, Cook County State's attorney, attorney Kim Fox, who is an African-American woman, says she was sickened by the accounts described in the series surviving R. Kelly, but noted that she cannot begin an investigation without uh, cooperating victims and witnesses, as reported by the Chicago Sun-Times. She called on the victims to come forward. Okay? Now, also, we know that um, in Georgia, uh, Fulton, Fulton County District Attorney's Office in uh, Georgia, uh, TMZ uh, is reporting that uh, they've opened an investigation into allegations made against uh, R. Kelly as well. And then also, there was a, uh, a good story from... WXYZ.com, WXYZ.com. Now, look, I did an hour, about an hour and a half uh, video earlier this week dealing with R. Kelly under criminal investigation. That's on YouTube, Michael M. Hotep on YouTube, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Go watch it there. I go in-depth in th into this. I don't have time now to get into that. It's also on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, The African History Network uh, on uh, Facebook as well, okay, and just click on videos there. All right, now, uh, WXYZ.com uh, had a good article and a good story dealing with uh, uh, understanding this on another level, dealing with R. Kelly, because people have been debating back and forth, and people, you know, get mad at me for still covering the story, and unfortunately, when African Americans come forward, because black women are the most disrespected women in this country, unfortunately, Many of our people attack the victim for coming forward, okay, and, and, and would rather protect somebody who is an alleged sexual predator because, unfortunately, we don't give a damn about black women. That comes from a self-hatred. So WXYZ.com had a story from uh, January 12, 2019. Surviving R. Kelly sheds light on bigger issues. Black women raped at higher rates but report less. I wonder why. Let's go to this clip. Play of the Me Too movement that many say is long overdue. Tonight, an attorney for R. Kelly says the singer hasn't seen a recent documentary about him in its entirety, but denies all the allegations it makes against him. The docuseries Surviving R. Kelly on Lifetime revisited old allegations of sexual misconduct involving both women and underage girls. It also brought new allegations to light. All the alleged victims who spoke out for the documentary are women of color. Tonight, News 5's Amanda Van Allen joins us live right now. And Amanda, you've been doing some research and you found out that black women are more likely to be raped than women of other races. Danita, they are, and the numbers are frightening. I spoke with the folks at the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center and they tell me not only are black women and girls raped more than any other group, they also report the abuse way less. 
There's a difference between R. Kelly and Robert. The stories are shocking. Shame on you! Shame on you! Shame on you! Survivor after survivor claimed they were sexually assaulted by R&B singer R. Kelly, many of them as teenagers. Maybe they stayed in silence because they didn't feel that they had a way out. Teresa Stafford from the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center watched the three-part series and says the women's stories are all too familiar. We actually see uh, a lot of young ladies who have been, you know, groomed into believing that somebody loves and cares for them, and then that person is actually taking advantage of them and victimizing them and causing harm to them. Stafford says this is especially true within the black community. We have to get it to a point in our society where we feel that black girls deserve the treatment and protection of other young girls in our community. Stafford says 60% of black girls are sexually abused by the time they turn 18. That's a number that is extremely higher than any of their other counterparts. She adds only one in 15 black women actually report the abuse. I think we have to get to a point in society that, that we are talking to our young black girls and just the black community as a whole having a conversation that sexual violence exists in the community and that we have a system and organizations ready to respond when these young ladies come forward to disclose. And after the series aired, there was an uptick to calls to rape hotlines nationwide. And the folks at the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center say they also saw a slight increase. And if you need anyone to talk to, their hotlines are open 24-7. That number is 216-619-6192. Live in the Tech Center, Amanda Van Allen, News 5. All right, so check that out. That was from the Cleveland affiliate for ABC uh, uh, news uh, and read the article from WXYZ.com, Channel 7 in Detroit. Surviving R. Kelly sheds light on bigger issue. Black women raped at higher rates but report less. The number they have in here for the National Sexual Assault Hotline is 1-800-656-HOPE. 1-800-656-HOPE or 4673. Uh, they are 24-7. You can also visit their website Online dot rain r a i n n dot org r r a n n r a i n n dot org online dot r a i n n dot org. I gave that number out in the broadcast I did earlier this week as well. So check that out. And if we look at what Chance the Rapper said, who's in the six part series. Now, if you haven't seen it on Lifetime, go and watch it. It may be on demand. I know they just re aired it uh, Friday night. Hello beautiful dot com. Chance the Rapper was uh, uh, he was uh, interviewed uh, for uh, earlier in the year for a, a separate interview, and it was included in this uh, documentary. But Chance the Rapper on R. Kelly's alleged victims, I didn't value their stories because they were black women. I didn't value their stories because they were black women. Now, I'm glad he admitted it, but this ties right into what the uh, piece was just saying. He said, but black women are exponentially a higher oppressed and violated group of people just in comparison to the whole world. Maybe I didn't care because I didn't value the accuser's stories because they were black women. OK, so we have to understand that black woman's most disrespected woman in America. We're the only people that allow music to degrade and dehumanize our women. And then we go out and support it. This, this see this. This is what happens when you've been stripped of your history and culture. And you buy into a culture that dehumanizes you. Nobody else does that because a people's history and culture gives them their VIPs, their values, their interests, and their principles. And it influences their media, it influences, it gives them a cultural paradigm that they see the world through. And what you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and your women and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. So we'll see you Tuesday at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, you can donate to the African History Network, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, we have our DVD lectures there, my lectures. Uh, we have uh, the, the uh, bundle packs, online courses, digital downloads. You can also email me, info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, info, I-N-F-O, at AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Look, I have to get out of here. We have to uh, make way for Pastor Mo coming up next. Remember, on the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it corrects wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Wakanda forever. We'll talk to you next week. Peace.
Hi again, everybody. This is Jack Lessonberry, and starting Monday, for the next two weeks, we'll be broadcasting my program, Primary Source, from Cobo Hall from the North American International Auto Show, every weekday morning from 9 to 11 here on the Superstation. Bye.